This broadcast of the Richmond Forum is made possible by the generous support of Altria. The world is neither flat, nor binary, nor finite. Black and white lie separated by countless shades of gray. We all see the world from our unique points of view. We begin to understand the world by adding the views of others. Their knowledge, their experience, their ideas, stories, and art. Their beliefs, failures, and triumphs. Tonight, we expand our worldview by adding depth to our understanding, dimension to someone known only from afar, perspective to our past, and a view of places we've never been. Together, we set out to change the world simply by changing the way we look at the world. At the Richmond Forum. Tonight, on the first full day of a new administration, we seek perspective by taking a long view of America's first-term presidents with acclaimed historians John Meacham and Doris Kearns Goodwin and our moderator, Steve Inskeep. Welcome. It is wonderful to be uh, with you tonight, especially because yesterday I was in Washington, D.C. and covered the inauguration and had a seat overlooking the platform, so I got to see the former presidents, the current president who was about to be the ex-president, the president-elect who was about to be the president, all of them shake hands, touch elbows, and, and work the room a little bit, and I'm trying to make sense of what on earth happened, as I think uh, <laughs> many of the rest of us are. However we may have voted in the election, this has been an, astonished, uh, an astonishing election. And I'd like to begin by asking you two what it's been like as historians to watch this last year and a half. I think there's a lot of people who have felt very dislocated, as if something is happening that has never happened before and that we don't understand. But you have such a rich uh, understanding of presidential history, I'd like to know how you see it. What's happening to us? <laughs> well, I, I can look back at history. People will ask you as a presidential historian, how did we get Trump, as if I'm going to know as an historian. But I think there is... And of is... course you know, right? You just kind of say, well... <laughs> well... That's well... why I came. Was <laughs> <laughs> if you look back to the turn of the 20th century, when you had a similar set of circumstances that I think are facing us today, you can see why the anxiety and the anger and the fear allowed a populist message, I think, to, to get through. At the turn of the 20th century, you had the Industrial Revolution, you had the economy upended, you had all sorts of inventions that were speeding up life, the telegraph, the telephone, the car. People felt like, rural people felt like the cities were taking them over. There was lots of immigration coming in from abroad. And you had demagoguery and you had populism. But normally, at least at that time, it was in a protest movement and didn't make its way, as this one did, into a major party. And I think what we see today is a technological revolution, immigration, people in the rural area feeling like they're separated off from the cities, a great gap between the rich and the poor, as we had at the turn of the 20th century. So that same potent mix, I think, allowed Trump to become the nominee. But the same historical mix wouldn't have worked if we hadn't had a shift in our presidential nominating system. Because in the old days, the politicians used to choose who it was that was at the conventions. And they always chose themselves. <laughs> Governors, senators, mayors, of course. They're there weren't choose. very many primaries at all. There were no primaries at, the at all. Conventions and on, they would vote. The delegates fact, would really vote. And yeah. the delegates would vote, but they were chosen by the party leaders. And so unless there was a military character around who they thought might help them win an election, they would choose a fellow politician. And if that were true now, there's no way that Donald Trump would have been chosen by the politicians, especially given when he talked yesterday about he hates that whole political class. But the primaries were started by my guy, Teddy Roosevelt. So it's his fault, my guy that I lived with for eight years. Because <laughs> Which in I guess makes it your fault. 
I think it's my yes, fault, yes. Exactly, because you were, so, you know. In 1912, he wants to run against Taft, but Taft is the president who's sitting there, and really sitting there, <laughs> and, and he has, and anyway, he has control of the party machinery, so Teddy's the only way he can get the nomination is to have a primary system. So he starts a crusade, let the people decide. 13 primaries are created. He wins the primaries mostly, but Taft still has the party machinery. Taft then loses the, wins the election, and then some Republican Senator said, now the only question, if Taft and Teddy are running against each other for the Republican nomination, is which corpse is going to get the most flowers? And it, of course, turns out that Woodrow Wilson wins. Primers go out of favor, and then they come back in in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and today, 85% of the delegates are chosen by the primaries. So the people spoke, and they responded to get, make America great again, and the message of anti-immigration and free trade, et cetera, that Mr. Trump put forward. So you hear resonances of the past and what has happened in the last year and a half, as different as it may seem to some of us now. What about you, John? I always hear, as a Southerner, I think that with Faulkner, you know, the past is never dead. It isn't even past. Uh, so, so, yeah. Um, you know, I've just done a, my first biography of a living president, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, whom I was able to call up and actually ask questions of. When Doris and I try to do that to our dead subjects, people get worried. <laughs> like, um, we do do it, though. We do if do you, it. It's if like you could hear us talking... You know, I remember there was one time when my kids were listening to me talking to Eleanor and Franklin in the room and saying, Eleanor, just forget that he had an affair so long ago. He, I, he really loved you. <laughs> Franklin, just be nicer to her. And they thought, what is going on in that room? But I'm sure you do it, more, too. More, it's a gossip, bit, more gossip about dead people. Doris, <laughs> Doris's life is, in, in moments like that is kind of like the shining meets C-SPAN. <laughs> um, so her friend. It's impossible. <laughs> we do interventions. I call Barnacle. I, um, uh, I absolutely do. Uh, I think I was totally wrong about Trump uh, starting in June. I thought that we were entering a moment like Richard Hofstetter's uh, famous essay published uh, as a cover story in Harper's Magazine in October 1964, the uh, penultimate month of the Johnson Goldwater race called The Paranoid Style in American Politics, which, in which Hofstetter traced the conspiracy <laughs> theories and worries of the 1790s when Jefferson thought that Hamilton was trying to sell us out to the, um, to the British. Uh, as a Jefferson biographer, by the way, if anyone here has any rap lyrics about Thomas Jefferson, meet me out back. <laughs> um, <laughs> working on that. Just my luck, it's the other guy. I have to What what rhymes? This is, this is, this is, I, okay, I promise on. this is relevant, sort of. <laughs> um, just has to have a little bit of relevance. It does, it does. But just quickly on Hamilton. I, when I was out talking about Thomas Jefferson some years ago, uh, Governor Christie of New Jersey uh, called and asked me to, very sweetly to come to lunch in Trenton to talk about Jefferson. And I was happy to do it. So I went out and he said, well, you know, I'm really more of a Hamiltonian. And I said, well, that's great, sir, but at least my guy didn't get shot in Jersey. <laughs> and the damnedest thing happened, I couldn't get back into the city. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. See how learned this audience is. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All that of was, his stories, you get them. <laughs> that, was before, that was before Governor Christie became Patty Hearst. So, um, <laughs> Back to Richard Hofstetter. Um, <laughs> In 1964, October. 1790. Paranoid style. Paranoid style. And so <laughs> you, you have these moments where there is a, a, a sense from a dispossessed, significantly dispossessed part of the public that believes that the system is, to use a current phrase, rigged against them. Uh, the Bavarian Illuminati uh, of, the oh early, my God. of the early republic, <laughs> uh, all the way to the John Birch Society uh, in, in 1964, which is what the occasion for Hofstetter's essay was. And what tends to happen, as Doris and Steve know, is that this paranoid energy, this populist energy, gets absorbed by the major party, usually before it can go get too far out of control. So... George Wallace, uh, the Republicans took a lot of that energy away from him. Uh, the Democratic Party, frankly, when it was the party of segregationists, took a lot of this energy away from Strom Thurmond, 
who ran as a Dixiecrat in 1948. Uh, Ross Perot, uh, you know, there, there was a little more populism. You know, the energy took, uh, was, was sucked away. That didn't happen this time. To some extent, Trump's triumph in the Republican Party was the first recorded case of a hijacker boarding a plane and having the passenger side with him. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, you just make these things up? <laughs> it really is. It really is. So, uh, so, to me, it's less broadly historical than this. I think two numbers explain why Donald Trump became the President of the United States yesterday. One is 17. <clears throat> When Doris's friend Lyndon Johnson was president in 1965, 77% of Americans trusted the federal government to do the right thing some or most of the time. 77. Today that number is 17%. Second number is $130,000. $130,000 is what Joe Biden's middle class task force in the White House said was the household income needed to live a classic post-World War II middle class life. Household income in this country, as you all know, is $55,700. In that missing gap of both trust and income, you had the gasoline on the floor, and then you had in this remarkable cultural figure. Remember, Trump is a cultural figure, not a political one first. He is the match that went on the floor, and that's what we're living with. We've resolved the whole problem. We're going to go now. <laughs> No, thank you. I really appreciate that. Uh, I, I appreciate all those insights. We're sitting here trying to put uh, uh, President Trump into historical context. Uh, do you think that President Trump has a deep appreciation of history? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, there thank you all for coming. <laughs> I mean, there have been there have been recent articles saying that um, he doesn't really read history mm -hmm. and, and doesn't read a lot. Um, and I, mean, I think it's a problem in the sense that, you know, Teddy Roosevelt said that books are the greatest companions and that for a leader there's nothing more important than understanding human nature. And you understand human nature in part through reading poetry or drama or literature. Harry Truman never went to college, but he read history. And I think it gave him, you, you got to believe, for those of us who loved history, that by reading about the people who went before and their struggles and triumphs, that you're going to learn something. You're going to grow from that. Just as we grow from our parents and our grandparents, you hopefully grow from the, you don't have to start all over again. I mean, the other day there was a picture in the newspaper, in a, in a British newspaper, of Trump's desk. And it had, um, and this sort of surprised me until, I said, I'll tell you what happened. So there was magazines on there, and then there was two copies of this new book, Unpredictable, or something about him. And then underneath was Team of Rivals, and it was sticking out, Team of Rivals. So a reporter called me up and said, this is exciting. And then they asked somebody in Trump, they said, well, no, somebody gave it to him as a gift, but he's not actively reading it. So, <laughs> um, but, I, you know, just to be fair to him. In, in fairness, he does read history because there are 30 years of magazines covers <laughs> that are on the desk with his face <laughs> with, uh, yes. on the, 30 years though that's a lot of history go on, go on sorry. <laughs> well I was going to say that um, to be fair to him he says he learns rather through conversation <coughs> and that was also true of FDR I mean FDR had read a lot before he got his polio and while he had his polio but in the presidency he read mostly mysteries at night he didn't read a lot of books during his time the same way Teddy did but he was able to absorb from conversations with people. That's how he learned. He was a great questioner, and he would listen, and he would absorb. So Trump says that's the way he learns, but that's really going to be required that people are around him who are talking to him and giving him information and have experts in the fields, and he can learn from them. Well, I, I went to see Mr. Trump uh, last May to talk about just this on assignment for Time magazine, and uh, went to Trump Tower, uh, he was very gracious. Um, it was a little like interviewing the Admiral and Mary Poppins. Um, you know, he had a hat. He was firing off cannons. Um, you know, it was this isolated universe. And um, Is he sitting behind a desk? Sitting behind the desk. And uh, there are golf trophies everywhere. And I recognize those because I have none. Uh, uh, and there are the, the, old the old magazine covers framed, and there are magazine covers of all, of, uh, all over. 
But this is, this is a really significant. He, he, he doesn't read history. Um, but his basic view is, and he said it this afternoon, visiting the George H.W. Bush Center for Intelligence at Langley when he went to see the CIA today, that he's a smart person. He believes that he is uh, intellectually equipped, largely by instinct, to do this job. And if you do what we do for a living, that seems unlikely. <laughs> but, but his point, which is a pure populist, <coughs> is that if the experts were so smart, why wouldn't the world be in better shape? That is, if the people who read history were so well-informed and so well-equipped, then why do we have that income gap? Why do we have a health care problem? Why do we have the situation in the Middle East that we have? And so, to some extent, why don't you allow someone who believes, who totally lives in the moment? I've never met a person who lives in the moment like this. I mean, it's, it's cable news, it's whatever comes across Twitter. You know, he's like an open synapse. He's just reacting. And, um, and I think that we have to, to some extent, respect the fact that a, the right number of voters in the right number of Absolutely. states made this decision. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, I pressed a good bit about, we talked about the Civil War because I was from Tennessee. Um, he asked interesting questions. Uh, he said, if Stonewall Jackson had been in charge, and st I, I, am I allowed to say this here, instead of General Lee, sorry, um, <laughs> you know, would that have been different? Uh, what would have happened if Forrest had been unleashed more? You know, sort of interesting sort of Ken Burns questions. Um, and he, he knew the figures. And he told me, well, he told me that he had once, and this is the ultimate sacrifice, he had once canceled a golf match because there was a marathon on of Ken's Civil War. <laughs> and so, and if you know Trump, to cancel golf is pretty much the ultimate sacrifice. Uh, <laughs> So, and then I called him back to see, is there anything? I said, have you read Doris? Have you read William Manchester? Have you read David McCullough? Mm. You know, so <laughs> he, he, he had read, he told me he had read Bill O'Reilly's books. Uh, uh, That's the assassination books. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah all, all, the, all, the, all the killing books. Uh, he'd read a book about the rise of ISIS and uh, one uh, negative partisan book about Hillary. And that's, that's it. I sort of admire, to some extent, I kind of admired the honesty of it. Uh, he believes he's a natural. Uh, he compared himself to Lydia Ko, the great Asian-American golfer. He said that she was once asked on a Golf Channel interview, which is the other thing he watches, um, what are your swing thoughts? And she said, I don't know, I just swing. He compared himself to Babe Ruth, who was once asked by a reporter, hey, babe, how do you hit the long ball? And Ruth apparently replied, I don't know, I just swing at it. He said, that's me. And he's repeated those points in subsequent interviews. We have, we have moved in the typical American way of moving from one guardrail to the other. We have moved from arguably the most intellectual president, certainly I would argue since Jefferson. Um, <laughs> avowedly the least traditionally intellectual president you can imagine. Oh, you know, the worries... Are we, are, are we still and within... He would, he would, and he would accept that. He would say, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not... And I'm that's not a good thing, he would say, yeah. Are we still within the guardrails? Uh, you know, the... the Just curious. <laughs> I'll tell you what worries me about the guardrails is that um, it was one thing during the campaign when he would get angry with somebody to be able to put out tweets that coarsened the dialogue terribly. The things he said about women, the things he said about a disabled person, the things he said about people who would say something mean about him. If that continues in the presidency, if when you're in the presidency, you're going to be criticized, you're going to have to learn how to manage and stress, stressful times, manage your negative emotions. And unless he can figure out a way to do that, and if he keeps tweeting out angry things, then the dialogue of the country and the polarization we're in now could get us over those guardrails. I mean, I keep wishing that he could have a fake Twitter account, that whenever he was feeling good, it could be the real one, and he'll talk to his people, and it'll be great. But whenever he's mad at somebody, he just does it, but it doesn't really go anywhere. I mean, it was just like Lincoln had this hot letter thing that he would do whenever he was angry with somebody. 
He would write a hot letter to the person and then put it aside, cool down psychologically, and never send it. The famous case of that is when General Meade failed to follow up with General Lee's army after Gettysburg. He was so upset that he wrote him this long letter saying, I'm immeasurably distressed. You didn't do what we asked you to do. The war could have been over soon. And then he knew it would paralyze the general in the field, so he put it aside. It was never even opened until the 20th century. And then underneath was the notation, never sent, never signed. And Lincoln did that regularly. When Franklin Roosevelt got angry with somebody, he would have drafts of speeches that might go four, five, six drafts. And a young speecher came in, speechwriter came in, and he heard him in this first draft saying horrible things about some isolationist congressman, calling him by name. He said, is he, is he really going to do that? The older speechwriter said, don't worry. Second draft, it's still there. By the sixth draft, all is sweet and light, but he got it out of his system. When I interviewed President Obama recently for an exit interview with Vanity Fair, I was telling him about Lincoln's hot letters. I said, do you ever think of doing that? He said, what do you mean? I do it all the time. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, I constantly, I'm writing things down and letters to the people I'm at, then I crumple them up and I put them in the wastebasket. But that <laughs> shows self-reflection. It shows an awareness of your weaknesses. It shows that you understand that you have to have a governor on yourself. The first... If conquering yourself as a leader is probably the most important thing. And unless he can conquer himself, then I worry about where these guardrails might be. I mean, that's one, ex one of the explanations for Watergate is that, you know, when Nixon said, go bomb Brookings or, you know, kill all the Democrats or whatever he said, you know, after a couple of sips of scotch, your H.R. Haldeman's job was just not to do anything. Right. And there's a theory that just Haldeman let it slip and they actually went and bombed Brookings. And this is uh, <clears throat> Henry Kissinger's famous line. Yeah. Which Explan is <clears throat> the explanation for Watergate was some damn fool went into Nixon's office and did what Nixon told him to do. <laughs> right. 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 You're also reminding me, I wish I could remember which comedian it was who was uh, positing the theory that Trump would be talking about Twitter one day and then suddenly discover that his tweets were public. <laughs> <laughs> and he hadn't realized up to then what was going, what was going on. I'd like to bring another president into the picture, uh, John Meacham, because you are a biographer of Andrew Jackson. As are what, you. What did, thank you. What did you think when people began making the comparison between Donald Trump and Andrew Jackson? Well, there's the hair. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> Beyond that, I don't see a hell of... No, just kidding. Um, no, the moment is Jacksonian, there's no question. Andrew Jackson <clears throat> was the first American president who was not a Virginia planter or an Adams from Massachusetts. Uh, Henry Clay coined the phrase self-made man in the age of Jackson. Jackson was that. He had come from the lowest reaches of white society. He was an orphan. His father had died before he was born. He lost his mother and his brothers in the revolution. Uh, he had just... <laughs> willed himself to the top of American life. Uh, when he came to Washington in 1829, however, he came as a former senator, a former judge, a former presidential candidate, and someone who, as Doris was just saying, understood his own weaknesses. He understood that he had a temper. This is a man who, when he took the oath of office, he had two bullets lodged in him from various duels. But one of the key things about Jackson to always remember is in those duels, he always fired the second shot. He would let the other person shoot, and then he would lower his gun and fire. Did he assume they wouldn't be very good shots? He, or he was willing to take the pain. He wanted, to take the, he wanted to take his time and make sure he killed the other make guy. Make sure. So <laughs> when he was the most, one of the most significant moments is his boot filled with blood as he killed a man, John Dickinson, who had attacked uh, his wife, Rachel. Um, the attack actually was, was, was true, but let's get into that later. <laughs> um, but I think that, to me, the great story about Jackson that separates it from, uh, from the Trump-Jacksonian comparisons, which, by the way, are quite recent. Uh, in that interview I did with him, Jackson never came up. Uh, I mean, if I'd, <laughs> if I'd mentioned him, he would have thought I was talking about Reggie. I mean, I don't, think, <laughs> I, I don't think it would have. We would have had a lot of, a lot of, a lot there. What, what, or what Mike, are the parallels know. between Donald but, Trump and Reggie Jackson? But, yeah, well, <laughs> no, 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 swing, no. Go on. They know how to swing. <laughs> no, they, uh, <laughs> no, so I think that I mean Jackson in 18th, the winter of 1832-33, uh, we had a showdown with South Carolina, <laughs> as usual. 
Uh, and um, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the we? Virginia. <laughs> we, the Jacksonians. Uh, you know, oh. John C. Calhoun, uh, who had been uh, his vice president, uh, Jackson's vice president in the first term. Jackson said, by the way, that his only two regrets in public life were that he had not hung Henry Clay and shot John C. Calhoun. So he did have a temper. Nobody, but nobody <laughs> felt that way about their vice president again until John McCain. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> just a free one. That's a free one. Okay. <laughs> That's just a freebie on inauguration weekend. Um, <laughs> So South Carolina wanted the right to nullify federal laws. Uh, Jackson pounded the desk, threatened, I'll hang the first nullifier as high as Haman. I'll walk into South Carolina with 10,000 men. Uh, your governor uh, actually sided with Jackson, which was hugely important because if he sided with South Carolina, the result might have been different. Um, but every, so he's, he's making all the right noises about warlike, fitting, you know, playing to type, the American Bonaparte that his opponents had feared. But what's he doing all night? All night, he's writing letters to Joel Poinsett, his man on the ground in South Carolina, saying, whatever you do, don't make the first move. If there is to be civil war, we must be in the right. We cannot be the aggressor. He was managing and marshalling his temper to get to the right place, and we got to the right place. It gave us 30 more years to form what Doris's guy, Lincoln, would later call the mystic chords of memory. The Jackson I believe in, and believe it is supported by the record, was someone who had a temper, but he had developed the temperament to control it. Yeah, temperament, it seems to me, it finally came up in the election, but it probably should have been some of the things we were looking at very beginning. What kind of a temperament a leader brings to any leadership job, much less the presidency, means their de basic disposition in life. Are they able to you know, meet with people from other places and understand them from inside? Are they able to control their emotions? And, and a lot of times that comes from, from having been through difficulties themselves. When he was asked about his temperament, Trump finally said, I have the best temperament of anybody who's ever, ever been in the presidency because I always win. And that's not true. I mean, the, all the leaders that I've studied, Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, LBJ too, they not only lost, but they suffered. And from that suffering, certainly Roosevelt Franklin became a much better president after having gone through his polio because he learned what it was like to have fate deal you an unkind hand so he could deal with other people who had not been as privileged as he was for whom fate had also dealt an unkind hand in a much deeper way. And there was a humility that he learned from that. And that's one of the temperamental qualities that it's not easy to see that Mr. Trump has. I mean, I was thinking, when we, I'm, this is going to make us really sound nut, but I was thinking about George Washington when he came to his inauguration. That was and, a limo. Yeah, <laughs> and he, here he is, George Washington, and he comes to the inauguration, and he's feeling, he said, like he's going to his execution. He wrote a letter to a friend, and he said, do I really have the political skill and the ability to deal with the ocean of difficulties I'm going to face, and I'm resting my name and our country's name on, on me? And then he said, well, what I can promise is integrity and firmness. And that's the kind of attitude one should have when it's taking over this huge job. And I don't see any indication whatsoever of humility. I or even a sense of, this is a huge job. Huge, I guess you might say yeah. that. I, I'd love to, you all react to this, tell me. I, I tried to, when, we were, when, the, when temperament became such a big issue in, in, in the campaign, which I was glad it did, um, I was trying to tease out, all right, well, what do we mean by that? And humility is one. The way I was thinking about humility was the ability at the highest levels to admit a mistake. Absolutely. Which I don't know about you all, but I'm terrible at it. And I'm not, I don't have the nuclear codes. And, which is good uh, for everybody. Um, but John Kennedy had the capacity after the Bay of Pigs to reach out to Dwight Eisenhower ask him to come to Camp David, he described how this disastrous decision had taken place. 
Eisenhower gave him some excellent advice, which was, you have to have everyone in the room, you have to have everyone, you have to be vetting everything, weighing all the information in one place so you can play people off each other. You can't just let the Joint Chiefs, the CIA, you know, the different service branches come in at you because you'll never be able to make a considered judgment. So what does he do in October of 1962? He convenes what is, in fact, the world's longest committee meeting. Of 13, 13 days. <laughs> the executive committee of the National Security Council is a direct result of the Bay of Pigs. Disaster in April of 61, salvation in October of 62. The night the Cuban Missile Crisis ended in a, one of the most mordant and chilling pieces of ironic humor in the history of the presidency, Jack Kennedy said to Mrs. Kennedy, I guess this is the night I should go to the theater because it'll never get any better than this. Ooh. It's, it's heartbreaking. But that was a level of humility, right. admitting a mistake. The other one, I believe, is empathy. You have to have empathy. You have to have the ability to put yourself in the other guy's shoes, whether it's your political opponent on the Hill or a leader uh, overseas. George Herbert Walker Bush, one of the most empathetic men uh, who ever drew breath, one of the reasons the Cold War ended as peaceably as it did is that when the Berlin Wall fell, despite what George Mitchell of the Senate and a lot of people in the press and Dick Gephardt wanted him to do, George Bush was not going to go to Berlin and, as he put it, dance on the wall. Uh, he wasn't, as he put it, he told me, he said, I didn't want to stick it in Gorbachev's ear. <laughs> I think he meant I. Anyway, <laughs> Maybe know. he's got some special thing. Yeah, exactly. But because he, but he knew that Gorbachev had hardliners and that if an American president showed up at the doorstep of the Soviet Union and declared victory in the defining struggle of the last 40 years, it would make Gorbachev's task harder. He put himself in the other guy's Absolutely. shoes. He paid a political cost. But that was entirely because this is a kid who, when he was growing up in Greenwich, Connecticut, was called Half Half Bush, because when he had a cookie or a candy bar, he would cut it in half and give it to the other kid. Hmm. There's a direct line between character and statecraft. Character is destiny. And you know, what's really interesting, I think, is that I think for some people, Empathy is inborn. One of the things I'm trying to figure out in my leadership book that I'm working on now is what qualities are inborn and what are developed. Most leadership traits, I think, are developed. But when I think about Lincoln as a little kid, just to go back to this, when other kids would be putting hot coals on turtles and loving to see them jump around, hurting the turtles, he not only couldn't bear it, but he wrote an essay in school about why it was wrong. He was feeling empathetic toward the turtle. Right. And, and then later, when you think of the great second inaugural that he gave, the whole idea of that is empathy. He's understanding no triumphal message is he delivering, despite the fact the war is coming to an end. But he knows his next task is to bring the South back into the Union. So it's the sin of slavery was shared by both sides. Both sides read the same Bible. Both prayed to the same God. Neither's prayers were fully answered. Reaching out to the South, hoping we become part of a union together. And Teddy Roosevelt once said that without fellow feeling, and he said he may not have had it growing up, but he consciously, as a politician, went to the tenement slums. He walked around as a police commissioner in the middle of the night to see what it was like to live in a slum. He said it may have felt subconsciously or conscious at first, but then after a while it becomes natural to figure out how other people are living. When he went to the Badlands after his wife and his mother died on the same day in the same house, he learned what it was like to, to be a cowboy and a rancher. And he said, without fellow feeling, which is the other word he used for empathy, a democracy is not going to work. Because if you start having class divisions and people seeing the other as something other than them, and that's where I fear we're at in our society yeah. right now, that what prevented the Democrats perhaps from understanding what the people who voted for Trump were feeling was they, they had lost that sense of connection. They hadn't had, the coasts were there and they hadn't had connections with the people who felt like the country was passing them by. And now it may be that the people who are voting for Trump and were happy are not feeling the same sense of empathy toward the people who lost. And if we can't do that with each other, as Teddy said in a democracy, that's the skill that we need to have as people. And I just hope if we can't depend upon it on the Washington level, then it's what we have to hope our kids are learning in school. Maybe this 
whole polarization that became so apparent in this last election will teach the teachers and our kids to start talking. There was an article the other day in a Boston magazine and I come from New England and probably do think of myself as a liberal, but it was scary. It said that 28 to 1 are liberals to conservatives in the colleges and the schools in New England, and that kids who are conservatives in schools like Brandeis or sometimes Harvard, they feel like they have to stay in the closet and not come out because they'll be made fun of. And sometimes the professors are making fun of, especially in this election, of Trump or something. And if it starts at that level, that you can't talk out differences and see things from other people's side, then we can't expect the leadership to do it at the top. 28, well, yeah, that's right. Go, John. 28 years ago yesterday, when uh, Bush 41 became president, he opened his inauguration, his inaugural address, with a prayer he'd written himself on some cards. <clears throat> and it basically said, help us, Lord, to use power not to make a great show in the world or only to help ourselves, but help, uh, enable us to use power to help people. Right. not to make a great show in the world. There's a level of a kind of decency, a kind of reticence there that is a vanishing cultural characteristic, not just in our politics, though we're now seeing it expressed there in, in, in epic terms. But, you know, we can all do, I think, with a little more of the kinder and gentler rhetoric. and. One of the things people talk about sometimes how Washington is out of touch, I think it's the opposite problem. Washington is too much a mirror of where we are culturally. Uh, congressmen, senators, presidents, they want to get reelected. Their unit of commerce is power. If we, to go to Doris's point, if we can figure out a way to answer what St. Augustine, because you haven't had St. Augustine thrown at you on a Saturday night in a while. <laughs> um, I hope. Uh, if so, you're hanging out in the wrong places. But St. Augustine defined a nation. It's the best definition I've ever found. It's in the city of God. He said that a nation is a multitude of rational beings united by the common objects of their love. They have to be rational. Yeah, but united by the common objects of their love. So one of the questions we always have to ask is, what do we love in common? And right now, the answer is too little. I agree. We I mean, stare I, at screens, we read what we want to read, we believe what we want to read, we believe what we want. And the triumph of opinion over fact is, is one of the most corrosive things in the country today. I mean, I, I think one of the uh, um, you go first. Yeah, I was, I was, <clears throat> I was talking with a senator, a uh, United States senator, who feels that the Senate is a completely dysfunctional body. And the reason, he said, was it's not that we agree on what the problem is and we argue over the solution. We don't even agree what the problems are. Right. You're saying that's a reflection of the country at no, large. And, and I think what makes that more troubling, too, is that when you look at the Congress in the 50s and the 60s, um, maybe even into the 70s, many of our congressmen and senators had been in World War II. They'd been in the Korean War. They knew what it was like to share a common mission and have to go across race and cultural lines to accomplish something together as a group. And now, because the draft isn't there, because very few of our veterans are now in public life, although somewhat more are going in there, I think that lack of a common mission is something that that is not in, in Washington. And I, I keep wishing that maybe we had some sort of national service. My son, Joe, as I think of some of you I may have told last time when I was here, but probably not, because we were talking about Lincoln. But anyway, right after 9-11, um, he had just graduated from Harvard College in history and literature. He joined the army. He was in Baghdad. He got a Bronze Star. He came out. He was then sent back to Afghanistan, came out, delaying going to Harvard Law School for 10 years, and he said he would never change it for anything in the world. Nothing made him prouder than being with 26 kids in that platoon and leading them through that period of combat. And he's now very much arguing for some sort of national service so that young people can experience that connection with one another, experience that sense.
sense of a common mission before they go into their private lives, which, as you're saying, have, have so seduced us all that that sense of coming together is, is so artificial in, in, in Facebook and things like that, rather than truly working together. No, that's exactly right. Let me... Uh... Um, to, go to, Steve, to go to your point about uh, common facts, I remember it's been six, seven years ago now um, when John Kerry first became the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, back in 10, I guess, uh, 10 or 11. Uh, it was the 40th anniversary of the Fulbright hearings, which, of course, was where he came to national prominence by saying, how do you ask a man to be the last man to die for a mistake? And we were at a particularly rough moment in Afghanistan. And I was going to write a column calling on him to have a kind of carry committee set of hearings about Afghanistan 10 years on. And really put a lot into it, do a, almost a Pentagon paper, study the whole thing, uh, make, you know, make it the focus. And so I called Senator Kerry to say I was going to do this. Did he have any interest in it? And as you all know, most of the time when you call a senator and you say, I think you should be on TV more, they, they're pretty receptive. <laughs> John said, I don't think it would work. I said, why? He said, because we would spend too much time arguing about the basic factual assumptions. Wow. That was John Kerry on that question. And I thought, frankly, Jesus Christ. If we can't have a debate about what, was, what is now our longest war, including the revolution, which Doris' son, uh, I mean, this war that Doris' son has served in so honorably, how, how can we deal with projecting force in a democratically legitimate way? The other thing I'll say quickly on this, does anyone in this room believe that if there were a selective service draft, not unlike the one in 66, 67, 68, 69, that we would be in the wars we are involved in today. Right, right. That's a devastating indictment of where we are as a democracy. Let me pose one more question to you. Uh, this time has flown. Um, in the days after the election, I was talking with uh, a guy who uh, I believe was disappointed by the result. And I recognize that in this room, surely there are people who were disappointed by the result and people who were happy about the result. And this man was saying, we imagine, we would like to imagine that progress continues, that we're always moving forward, that we're always improving at least a little bit. But he said, I'm not sure that's true. Sometimes mankind goes back, leaps back in time. And we do have a moment in which a president is being replaced by another president whose starting point, we don't know really what's going to happen, but whose starting point for negotiation is, I want to undo everything that's been done in the last eight years. Let's go back eight years and have those debates all over again, which does raise a question. Do you think that <clears throat> progress one way or another does continue forward, that President Obama is right, that history zigs and zags, that, but, but moves forward, that Martin Luther King is right about the arc of, 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 of justice being long, but or arc of history is long, but bending toward justice? Or do we sometimes take a leap backward into darkness? I think I agree with President Obama on this, that I think that if you look at history, and I think it's what's given him a certain kind of stability as he's leaving this office. You know, when, when I interviewed him this summer, everything looked so much more positive in the sense of what his legacy was going to be. Health care would be there, the nuclear deal with Iran, the climate change agreement in Paris. And I, I haven't seen him since then, but one would imagine that the election was as much of a, a sadness for him almost as it was for Hillary, worrying that some of the things that he had put forward that he would be remembered for, that he hoping was good for the country. And yet he hasn't lost his spirit. As, and I don't think it's just putting it on publicly. And I think it is because he has that philosophy, as, he, as he's quoted Martin Luther King a lot, that societies, people, they sometimes zigzag. But there is a move in America, anyway, toward greater progress. I mean, even as we looked these last summers at what was happening in the inner cities and the police brutality and the, and the problems with the 
um, the civil rights marches that then came out of it, and it looked like we were back, way back. I mean, so much progress has been made for African Americans, even in the last 15 years and 20 years and 30 years, that we forget sometimes. And that's been part of the oddness of this election, because if we listen to what Mr. Trump was saying, even though it's absolutely true that the people who were left behind by the manufacturing, the people who feel a sense that the rural communities have not been dignified in a certain way, that have not just lost a job, but lost their sense of self-esteem, they, they need something different. But the country itself is better now than it was eight years ago. You would think it had gone way downhill because of the way the election was. Um, but I guess just you have to, I have to be, when you think about America and the ideal that we have set for ourselves as a beacon of hope for other countries, and I think about those debates that Abraham Lincoln had with Stephen Douglas and where he said that the thing was you couldn't blow out the moral lights. He thought that, that Stephen Douglas was trying to make us go backward. And he said that if you're trying to perfect the union, Lincoln was saying, I can't say it like he did, it was so much better than this, you're gonna be always a gap between where you want it to be, but if you keep moving toward that, even if you sometimes go in a horizontal way, you'll keep going that way, as long as you don't consciously try to go backward. And I guess I believe when you look at history, and maybe it's just being an optimist, having been a Brooklyn Dodger fan and a Red Sox fan for so many years, <laughs> I've had to be an optimist, but I think it's a characterological... It paid off eventually. It's a characterological trait. Um, and I, I think I see it in American history and in the American character. What do you think, Yankee fan? <laughs> well, I'm a Southerner and a Christian, so I know how to lose. Um, <laughs> uh, Robert Louis Stevenson once said, the duty of the Christian is not to succeed, but to fail cheerfully. That's me. <laughs> um, I, I, I think there are two different questions. I think the question is, are we falling back now? And can there be a fallback? Robert Penn Warren once said that uh, history, like nature, knows no leaps, except the leap backward, maybe. Uh, which is, I read that years and years ago. I don't ago. think I understand it. History, like nature, knows no leaps, that is, we don't, we don't go vastly forward in one moment. Oh, nature, uh, of course, go ahead. we go backward. Okay. And so, you know, if you do what we do for a living, you know that almost all great moments are contingent. And as JFK said during the Cuban Missile Crisis, I, you know, God knows what'll happen, there's always some son of a bitch down the line who doesn't get the word. Right. You know, we could have pushed a button. <laughs> um, you know, if uh, Doris is writing a book about leadership and, and her presidents, if Abraham Lincoln hadn't been where he was in 61, we might have had a very different result. If Lyndon Johnson had not been where he was on Bloody Sunday, you might have had a very different result. Uh, you needed a master legislator. You needed somebody who understood and spoke the vernacular of the South, of the segregated South, to make that happen. Um, I believe Ronald Reagan was a providential figure in many ways. Uh, Two of the most significant political figures of the second half of the 20th century in global terms were both actors. They projected a reality of a world that we couldn't see, but we wanted to. And that was Ronald Reagan and John Paul II. And they were both able to help bring communism down because of those theatrical skills. I think we could add FDR to that. He once thought he was as good an actor as Orson Welles. That's right, that's right, yeah. well, that's right. And he, He's, didn't he once look at it, watch himself approvingly in a newsreel and say, that was the garbo in me. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, we do this at bar mitzvahs. <laughs> um, if you need us. Um, Sumner Wells once said. Um, sorry. Um, so, yes. I think... <laughs> I was supposed to keep him in line tonight. I, know, I don't worry, think I'm no, doing a good worry, job. Don't worry. Wait, 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 wait till we get to founding father, Mr. Uh, so I, I think... Um, That's the question and answer session. I, I, father, Mr. I think it's certainly possible for us to fall off what FDR said in his uh, 1945 inaugural. He quoted Indicate Peabody, his old headmaster at uh, Groton, who said that my old schoolmaster always said that the line of civilization may zig and zag, but ultimately it moves forward. I desperately want to believe that. I do believe that. But in, intellectual honesty requires me to say the history of the 20th century and what happened to seemingly civilized nations suggests that darkness is always nearby.
And that's why what you're doing here by coming to listen and coming to talk to each other and engage with the life of the nation is so important. Could we have a moment where uh, different groups of the country are pushing themselves forward and making themselves heard? There were groups in 2008, a different set of people in 2016, and maybe we come to some accommodation three years from now, five years from now. Well, I think, you know, what was interesting about watching the march, marches today of women not only in Washington but all over the country was that in contrast to the protest that took place at the inauguration yesterday, which was really rather random and violent and there was nothing they were marching for and that it was sad, today seemed to me, again, whatever you feel, it's galvanizing people to fight for their rights now and to oppose in a, in a real way. They're arguing, they were arguing, I mean, some of the signs were anti-Trump, but some of them were economic equity or I don't want to be spoken to this way as was happening during the course of the campaign or I, I care about reproductive rights or I care about Planned Parenthood. And, and so they were arguing for goals. I mean, there was a suffragette protest at Woodrow Wilson's inaugural. So I think that, that that's the important thing right now is that if what happens, and this is what was interesting, which was what Obama said, that he was going to stay out of things unless certain things happened. If there was an attempt to try and cut back on voting rights, or if there were, um, I forget what the other ones were, there were a couple other ones. And, um, and I think that's true for the country. You know, we have to give Trump a chance right now. I mean, we've got to hope that somehow that moment will pivot when he will become president and, and be able to deal with this extraordinary responsibility and that his instincts will then be helped by the people that he puts around him. But if he doesn't, then I think we have to, we have, people have to fight and fight in the right way by just opposing in a one, peaceful one way. One of the things that happened in the time of Andrew Jackson was that he accused his opponents of being elitist aristocrats and out of touch, and it was sort of true. Um, and his opponents, after uh, having their heads handed to them several times, realized that they needed to be more democratic and be more organized and be more sophisticated right. about their politics. And Jackson founded the Democratic Party and the opponents founded the Whig Party uh, and elements of that later became the Republican Party. We got the two-party system out of that. And I would think that even people who hated Andrew Jackson would ultimately have to be a little grateful to him for, for pushing them to get more people involved in democracy. And maybe that's the thing that we can see That would be the best thing now. that could come out of that instead of spectators. I mean, people have little time today because of how much time, especially young people, are spending on Facebook or on email or whatever they're doing that doesn't allow them to come together as citizens to real, I mean, they did go for Bernie Sanders to a certain extent, but then I'm not sure that those same people who were protesting right after Trump won actually didn't vote, some of them. People would say, have you voted? And they didn't, yeah. unless you carry through your citizen responsibilities. But if this galvanizes more activity on both sides, in a positive way for people to become citizens as opposed to spectators, then that's a good thing that could come out One of this. One quick, ju just because of where we are, Jefferson, because you're seeing this. Jefferson's point on this was man, is, man should be a participant in the politics of the state and nation, not simply at elections, right. but every day. Right. Great word to end on. For now. Thanks very much. Okay. So we're going to take a break, come back and take some of your questions. Thanks for joining us so far. This has been great. Really appreciate it. Richard T., someone who doesn't want his uh, last name used. Thinking of presidents you personally spent time with. Isn't that cool? Like we're on stage with, like, you know, people who personally spent time with presidents. Isn't that great? <laughs> um, Doris, can you name one characteristic that Donald, characteristic that Donald Trump might share with LBJ? Coarseness. <laughs> I mean, in in a, I mean, no, I'll, I'll I'll be fairer about that. I mean, LBJ had an unusual way of speaking when he was talking, in not in public but in private. It was entertaining. It was it was sort of instinctive, and sometimes when you hear what Donald Trump says, it's interesting. You know, I mean, it's a weird mixture of words, but they come out interesting. And, 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 and that was that was Definitely true. interesting. I think America <laughs> can agree on that. Yeah, yeah on. no, I mean, and, and um, declarative and short and um, straightforward. And I don't know whether he tells stories. 
I mean, that's an important part, I think, of leadership, to be able to tell stories. And LBJ was a great storyteller. I mean, even if half his stories weren't true, they were wonderful nonetheless. <laughs> oh, that's another characteristic. I mean, LBJ liked to engage in hyperbole a little bit. I mean, he, Truthful I remember, hyperbole or just well, hyperbole? it had a truth somewhere along the line. Like, I remember one day I was swimming with him in this obstacle-laden pool he had at his ranch where he didn't really want to swim because he, he just wanted to talk the whole time. So there were... Um, rafts with floating telephones and floating memo pads and <laughs> had to sort of go around the rafts. Anyway, that day um, a reporter had written, he was still president, had written a story about um, his speech to troops going abroad in which he mentioned that he had a great-great-grandfather who died at the Battle of the Alamo and the reporter said it was a wonderfully stirring speech except he didn't have a great-great-grandfather who died at the Alamo. He must have just wanted to so much that he made him up. So I turned to him in the middle of this pool and I said, how can you do that? He said, oh, these journalists, they're such sticklers for detail. <laughs> <laughs> and then he tells me how his great-great-grandfather had really died at the Battle of San Jacinto. And he went into a whole description of how that battle was even more important than the Alamo. And, and, and I thought, you know, maybe he's right, until I found out the guy hadn't died there either. <laughs> so Richard T. puts the same question to you, John. Can you name a characteristic that Donald Trump shares with George H.W. Bush? Jesus, I knew that was coming. Um, Honestly, no. Um, Thank you very much. And Next I'm not question. Being, I'm not, and, and for, I'm not trying to be clever. Uh, you know, I believe that the movement in the last 30 years from George Herbert Walker Bush to Donald Trump disproves Darwin. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's just what I believe. You know, you can, you can you take it or leave it, but it's what I believe. Um, George Bush put the country first as often as he could. He was not perfect. He was not a, you know, he was not a saint. Uh, as he once said to me, politics is not a pure undertaking, not if you want to win, it's not. Uh, he ran a brutal campaign in 1988, and yet when he got to Washington, he tried to create a culture of compromise and consensus. He opposed the 1964 Civil Rights Act in Texas, uncomfortable reality to talk about now. But in 1968, when he was actually in Congress, he voted for fair housing, much to the fury of his constituents in Houston. Um, to me, the drama of George was is that he did almost anything he had to do to achieve power. But once he had power, he did almost anything he could to do the right thing. And in a political life, I don't think there's much a much warmer way to look at it. Uh, he's not a preacher, he's not a philosopher. Consistency is not the test for him or for any politician, it seems to me. To me, it's effectiveness. To me, it's uh, a kind of moral clarity at, at when things are really, really dark. Um, but no, I, I, I don't. Uh, I don't see that. Uh, and they come from different, I mean, different worlds in the sense that <clears throat> Donald Trump is a product and would not be president without the rise of reality television and the infusion of the entertainment and political worlds. George H.W. Bush, you know, he, he, he liked Dana Carvey's imitation of him. Uh, you know, Wouldn't not be gonna do it. Uh, I, once, I once asked him, I, once, I called prudent. Dana when I was doing the book and said, how did you build your George Bush? And Dana said, oh, it was easy. It was Mr. Rogers trying to be John Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so here, so I'll, I'll close this point off with this. Here's, the, here's a difference, since you, you asked for similarity. Um, Trump has tweeted at least twice, furious about Alec Baldwin's portrayal of him on Saturday Night Live. When George Bush lost to Bill Clinton in 1992, devastating personal loss. The listening to the audio diary entries are tear provoking because of the, the desperate uh, depths that it put Bush in because he felt he'd let everyone down. He wanted to lift the staff's spirits. So he invited Dana Carvey <laughs> to come to the White House to spend the night and to perform in the East Room. To perform George Bush? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> One guy is attacking Alec Baldwin. The other guy invited his Alec Baldwin to come to the White House. Hello, Darwin. <laughs> <laughs>
This question from an anonymous questioner. Do you think that there are similarities between Trump's America First approach and the isolationism that the United States adopted after World War I? There's a similarity of language because Charles Lindbergh, who was essentially isolationist, used that phrase, America First. I think so, uh, just briefly. Uh, I think that, you know, Smoot-Hawley, uh, the isolationism, the... the uh, should we explain Smoot-Hawley was a tariff that was passed early in the uh, These people Prussian. are with me on okay, Smoot-Hawley. Fine. It's fine. <laughs> it's they fine. don't think it's a cocktail at the bar. They're fine. <laughs> you might think I'll it's a law firm. Smoot -Hawley. Yeah, it sounds like exactly, a law firm. Exactly. <laughs> double Smoot-Hawley. radio guys are okay. always trying to talk a lot. You know? Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> no, so I think, I Please, think the isolationism, the, uh, the neutrality acts, uh, which FDR had to fight uh, really starting with... Uh, with the destroyers for bases deal in 40 and then lend lease in 41. It's all of a piece. And remember, this is a personal, uh, poor Doris has had to hear this before, a personal obsession of mine. We did not declare war on Nazi Germany on the 8th of December, 1941. True. We waited until Hitler declared war on us on Thursday the 11th. And then we declared on the 12th. Roosevelt was worried enough and expressed it to people around him that the America First was dead in the Pacific but was not yet dead in the European War. So even after Pearl Harbor, there was a fear in that week. And it was, it was the longest week of Winston Churchill's life. Uh, Churchill invited himself to the White House on the night of Pearl Harbor, and FDR held him off until that, until that had happened. And then, of course, FDR came... Uh, Churchill came and they had the famous Christmas together. Yeah, I think the worrisome thing about the resurgence of nationalism, um, which is part of the American first thing and isolationism, is that oh, it's happening all over the, the world right yeah. now. And that means if people are, are looking at their own interests, um, what's going to happen with alliances? I mean, what came out of World War II after the experience that Roosevelt had had in 39, 40, having to fight against that American first. It wasn't just the American firsters, but they had a majority opinion for a period of time. The experience of World War I had been so traumatic and a war that was fought and nobody understood afterwards what it had been fought for and things had gotten worse. So there was a reason why they felt that, but things were happening in Europe that had to be dealt with. If there ever was a war that had to be fought, it was World War II. And we lost a couple years of preparation. I mean, finally it caught up the mobilization. And then what comes out of World War II is the United Nations, NATO, aid to Greece and Turkey, um, the Marshall Plan, and that's what made America the world leader that we became. And if we now undo those alliances for that isolationism again, then I don't know what happens to America's leadership in the world. But you're exactly right that it's, it's not just isolationism in fortress America terms. It's if we're going to have fortress Europe and, and fortress, uh, Pacific fortress. And the president, still interesting to say that, um, the president has said, and I think part of the subtext of why doesn't Japan defend itself? Why doesn't South Korea defend itself? Why doesn't Saudi Arabia? Part of that is the kind of nationalism Doris is talking about. And remember, what led to the Second World War was you know, the enormous crash and the, the pressures here fed that isolationism, but it was the rise of nationalism as the empires broke up right. and, uh, after World War I. And it's, it goes back to where we left a moment ago. Of course, this is, history is a slippery slope. And, it, and Mark Twain once said, it may not, history may not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Right. right. <laughs> those are one of those great comments that I never quite understand what they mean. <laughs> the next question here, don't you think that Mr. Trump will be restrained by the system? Hadn't worked so far. The constitutional system? I think that's, that's what is great, meant by the this. The great hope, yeah, is that the Madisonian construct of checks and balances does it. Um, he's going to go off on Madison now because he's writing a book about him. <laughs> but but that's, that's the hope. But, you know, since TR, really, Lincoln, there's a line of Jackson, Lincoln, TR, FDR. You know, the presidency has become, what was Kennedy's phrase, the vital center of action. Uh, it's, we fetishize it to some extent. 
It's the center of our consciousness. In some ways, it's the center of our culture, in a way. And so I think that, yes, there's, there's certainly hope that Article I, Article II, and Article Three will do what they were supposed to do. But, you know, we, we, have a, we have a system in Washington right now where there is a live debate going on in the Democratic Party that they should leave the Supreme Court seat of Justice Scalia open. By filibustering any nominee. Until there's a Democratic president again. Now, my view is that, you know, this federal, because we haven't talked about this enough, the Federal Judiciary Act of 1789, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which gave I hope us, you have your sleeping bags ready. Exactly. <laughs> I wonder if that first questioner's back from the bar. Um, <laughs> after his smoot holly with a twist. <laughs> um, well, we had six justices. We had five. No, we had six, then we had seven. We went up to ten, then we went back to nine. And so it's moved around. But the, my, my point is that, yeah, he may be constrained by the system, but it's a system that is already uh, in such deep corrosion that it's not functioning in the way we have expected even before this guy got to town. What do you think, Doris? I think that part of the difficulty for um, President Trump is that as a businessman, the kind of constraints that you, you don't have the same constraints. You can fire people. Um, you can give bonuses to people who do well. Um, he's, I think he's going to come up against, isn't there some saying with Eisenhower that they said he was a sad man because as a military leader, he could give orders and people would follow. And that's not necessarily going to, that's Truman not right. Said that. Truman yes. said that. I knew it was one, one of our guys. Yeah, Tr <laughs> Truman said, poor, poor Ike. Poor Ike, yes, he's yes. He's going to think it's a, but actually it wasn't quite true because Eisenhower loved process. Right, he actually liked things being slow and, and, and coming up. That's why the Kennedys blew all that away and they got in trouble early. You know, I, I was thinking about Truman and Eisenhower because there was some story that Truman loved to tell that he was going to um, Eisenhower's inauguration and they're in the car, like we see these people going. And um, Eisenhower says to Truman, you know, <laughs> come to your inauguration because I was afraid I would outshine you. And then Truman said, you didn't come because I didn't invite you. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Do you think there's been a president who brought disruption and a change of direction like Mr. Trump? Well, if you could argue, certainly a change of direction occurred hugely with FDR. I mean, you had um, the depression was already in, in almost at rock bottom by the time he took office. And the whole idea that had stifled Herbert Hoover was, who was a good man, I think, in a lot of ways, but he didn't believe that the federal government should and could have a real role in providing relief or providing jobs at any large level. He waited until too long to do that. And so it was a whole question of what government's relationship was with the private world, and FDR disrupted it, changed the system, made government an active player, and then you could argue when Reagan came in and argued that government was the problem and not the solution, he created a whole generation of conservatives, just as FDR had created a generation of liberals in a certain way. So, I mean, disruption doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. It means a, a change, and we've certainly seen changes. We saw a change when Teddy Roosevelt took over after McKinley, um, where the Republican Party had been the pro-business political boss party, and Teddy saw the hidden dangers in the country that were the monopolies were building, small, small companies were being built up by, into large companies, and the factories were exploiting women and children, and he got regulation and government to be involved for the first time, even in arbitrating a coal strike. So you don't see it a lot, that big change, but we certainly have seen it. What about Andrew Jackson? Was he a disruptor? Well, he, yes, but, but <coughs> it was almost more in style than in substance, at least early on, um, as you know. Uh, he, people think that you know, he cleaned the entire bureaucracy out. He actually did it with some skill and some uh, care. Uh, ultimately, his most disruptive act was vetoing the recharter of the bank. Um, which is totally controversial. But remember, the bank was not like the Federal Reserve. The Bank of the United, Second Bank of the United States took taxpayers' deposits and then threw off interest for private shareholders 
while keeping most of the members of Congress on retainer as counsel to the bank. So, I mean, yes, maybe he was a little harsh about it, but when he, when he called it a hydra of corruption, he wasn't too far off. Uh, so, but I would also say, to the risk of, I guess I've passed the self-parody sign a long time ago, uh, 1801. I mean, Jefferson saw his election in 1801 in such terms that he called yeah, it, he yeah. called it the revolution of 1800. Um, and in fact, it was Hamilton actually who saw rightly when Burr and Jefferson were stuck in a fight in the House uh, in the Electoral College because um, it was in the House because there had been a, a hiccup with the Electoral College and Burr had the same number of electoral votes as Jefferson to become president. Hamilton threw Federalist support to Jefferson because he said, despite all the rhetoric, Jefferson is someone who's not going to tear everything up rant, uh, root, and, uh, rant, root and branch. And that's a change of direction, a disruption, but it was within the conventions of the time. What's so different about this, and you know, it's like the New York Times is not allowed to use the word unprecedented on the grounds that everything ultimately is precedented, <laughs> but this is as close as it comes because we simply don't know how much of the bombastic, uh, oddly temperamental, challenging vernacular of Trump's candidacy unto yesterday, unto this afternoon, is actually going, he's going to attempt to translate into deliverables. And so we just simply don't know. I think one of the encouraging thing was that when somebody had questioned him about the fact that in the hearings, a lot of the candidates for the cabinet posts had disagreed with his ideas, and they did in many, in many ways. And in, he, instead of tweeting anger at them, he tweeted in general, great job, everybody, and he said, I want people who can argue with me. Now, so there may be a distinction between his upsetment when it's a personal attack on him versus attack on his ideas, which means we may not know what ideas he really holds dear. And, um, and that's what we need to find out, is if he can make that distinction. Uh, L.R. asks this question. I saw a report this morning that President Trump had a bust of Theodore Roosevelt put in the Oval Office. Oh, really? Oh. What's the significance? Well, I, I can see why he would, he would like a Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, manly man? Ma a manly man, but a man who also spoke in short, punchy language that the people loved. Uh, he came into the presidency at a time when the media was right for him. That's one of the things that's interesting about presidents and time and the man fitting the times. Lincoln was lucky to be alive at a time when his speeches would be reprinted in full yep. in the newspapers and then read by pamphlets in city homes and farms all over the, <laughs> the country. Teddy comes in at the time of the mass market newspaper, and he's the perfect character. I mean, a cartoon character, and he says fun things. You know, he, he said that my Harvard people might think that I speak in too folksy language, but the people know what I'm saying. He had all these sayings, you know, speak softly and carry a big stick. He even gave Maxwell House the slogan, good to the very last drop. And um, so I can see, and he was a fighter, and he fought the establishment, even of his own party. In fact, one of Trump's advisors, uh, Scaramucci, who was Anthony just Scaramucci. in Davos, was likening this situation to the situation at the turn of the 20th century. And he said the interesting thing was that Teddy Roosevelt was the, the author of the progressivism inside the Republican Party. So he was, saying, he was almost saying, this is where we need to go, and it's going to take a while to get the economy moving in the direction just as Teddy moved it then. So I, can, I think he'd like Teddy. I mean, as a, you know, if, if we were to put them together, um, they, they'd be pretty interesting characters. Mm -hmm. Except that Teddy was able to channel that populist energy into moderate, rational action. I mean, the things he did finally the Republican Party was able to accept them. Yeah. So that's, and he, and he nursed them along until they, or he pushed them along. But he mobilized the public um, in a certain sense to push the Congress. That's like Trump. But he had a great relationship with the press. That's yeah. a totally different thing. I mean, they were his, 
they, they, they were necessary for him as investigative reporters to show the conditions of the society so people would understand why things had to change. He actually so wanted good. people in the press to go out and investigate things, even investigate, you right, investigate agencies under his control. Absolutely, absolutely. So go find a scandal in my own agency right. so that and I then know I will, there. I'll, And if you find something that's truthful, I'm going to deal with it. Absolutely. Which raises another question here from Gloria. Are either of you concerned about attacks on the press or that their access might be shut down? Uh, yes, uh, I do think that we have to define the press now. Uh, it's like saying, you know, the media. I mean, everyone here is a member of the media. If you have a social media account, you have the capacity to speak to the whole world. And if what you say attracts enough attention, it could reach as many people as Walter Cronkite ever did. Uh, we have cable networks that are like the partisan press of, uh, of the, the 19th, 19th century, uh, right. 18th and 19th and 20th century, uh, early 20th centuries. To some extent, and Doris wrote about this in, in the Bully Pulpit, you know, the 20th century, in, in the view of the press as a neutral seeming organ, <coughs> is a product of the progressive era. Uh, Adolf Ox, who bought the Chattanooga Times first, important detail, uh, in 1892, and then bought the New York Times in 1896. One of the reasons he set that paper up as without fear or favor was because there were 40 other daily papers in New York that had every possible party affiliation. So it was actually a marketing strategy. If he could say that this is the place where you can get neutral information, he had something to sell. He had a business model. And that slowly became uh, more, more central. What the 21st century has done with cable and the internet is taken us straight right, back exactly. to the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, so I think that, I mean, I think these press, the, the so-called press conferences, uh, it started with the one with the Trump vodka and the steaks um, back at Mar-a-Lago, and then the one, the transition one, a week, two weeks ago, I guess, really had more in common with infomercials than with press conferences. There were supporters there, they were clapping, uh, that's outside the bounds, it seems to me, of what a president should do. In fact, presidents need things like press conferences to, to keep, them, keep them honest with themselves. I mean, FDR would have two press conferences a week, to, and, and Teddy Roosevelt would meet with the press every day while he was being shaved by the barber, his midday shave. The poor barber has a straight-edge razor, and the press is around asking him questions, and Teddy's bumping around. <laughs> it's amazing that he lasted, but he understood that... <laughs> Um, he understood, he said, that they were going to criticize him, and they understood that sometimes, you know, they would criticize him, but he knew that in a democracy, you need, you need the press. They're, the, they're your channel to the people. Um, there's a moment when a journalist had criticized his memoir that he wrote about the Spanish-American War, and he said that it, he had placed himself so much in the middle of every action of every battle of the war that he should have called the memoir Alone in Cuba. <laughs> and so what does he do? This is a famous journalist. And what does he do? He writes him a letter and says, I regret to tell you that my wife and my children absolutely adored your title for my book. Yeah. Now you owe me something. Come and visit me. I've always wanted to meet you. That's the kind of combination you have to have, that willing to realize that you need them, they need you. That's what democracy is. The press is always going to be fussing with politicians, but they need each other. In 1992, when Pat Buchanan was challenging George H.W. Bush for re-election, getting 40% of the vote in New Hampshire, we forget this. There, there's something of right. a line between Pat Buchanan to Ross Perot <clears throat> to Donald Trump. Uh, Lim Rush Limbaugh was killing Bush, uh, the, the incumbent President Bush, every day. B Limbaugh had gone national in 88. <clears throat> He was really big by 92. I think those were the 20 million listener days. Wow. Bush and uses Roger Ailes to broker a meeting. He invites Limbaugh to the White House. He carries Limbaugh's bag upstairs to the Lincoln bedroom and spends the evening with him. And things got a little gentler. Wait, you, you made a little gap. You're in the Lincoln bedroom and he spends the evening with him? <laughs> Doris. <laughs> <laughs> you are a New England liberal. <laughs> I am a poor boy from Tennessee. <laughs> and I am more open-minded than you are. <laughs> it is, as, Tim, as our friend Tim Russell used to say, what a country. <laughs> USA. <laughs>
Did we have a flow of conversation? I can't even remember what it was. <laughs> Were you making a point? Were you making? Oh, what? I do. Want to yes. I do have another point. Yes. As Doris, what Doris said about press conference is exactly right. And as as someone who sleeps with a speechwriter, which you do, um, you started it, babe. Um, <laughs> Bill Sapphire used to say <laughs> that State of the Unions were hugely important because the State of the Union writing of that speech was really the only way to get federal agencies to decide anything. <laughs> That's true. Because they had to, he had, the president had to have something to announce or you know, there had to be specifics. So the speech itself, much like press conferences, actually forced bureaucratic clarity in a way that would, they would not have done That's without right. it. Final question comes from Lynn. What new books are you presently working on? You tell. This is exciting. I'm doing Dolly and James Madison. Um, Isn't that great? And uh, Angelina Jolie is going to play <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> Actually, let me. Let and me you're text auditioning. That idea. Um, <laughs> And you're auditioning for the James Madison role then, I uh, Madison, poor Madison. Uh, I, what I want to do is, um, uh, Madison has been literally and figuratively overshadowed. Uh, he was a little guy, uh, about 5'4", as you all know, from over in Orange County, um, and lost between Washington and Hamilton and, and Jefferson, all of whom have been rediscovered and celebrated rightly. Uh, Madison was not only the architect of the Constitution, uh, but a two-term war president who won the ratifying war for the country and basically drove the opposition party out of business. Uh, by the time James Monroe succeeds him, the Federalists are pretty much dead. And so I want to try to figure out what kind of not only philosophical mind he had, but what kind of a politician was he? How did he project enough sense of confidence and authority to be part of that Virginia dynasty and to uh, really shape? He fought the one war we fought where no civil liberties were curtailed. Uh, he very much wanted uh, the War of 1812 to be a the war a republic would be proud of. And, uh, and then Dolly's just amazing fun oh, with her yeah. turban and she took snuff. <laughs> I'm already in love with her. So. <laughs> it's, um, it's said that in presidential elections, the taller candidate tends to win. Did he run against somebody who was 5'2"? No, no, no. no. <laughs> See, that's typical NPR sensationalism. <laughs> <laughs> it's what we're known for. I know it. <laughs> Got to get the clicks. <laughs> so I, oh, I, I, radio thought it, I thought it was Inside Edition. What yeah. <laughs> Morning. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said a little bit about what I'm working on. Mainly what happened is that after having done Lyndon Johnson and the Kennedys and FDR and, and Lincoln and then Teddy and Taft, it's hard for me to figure out where I go after that. I can't go back to you know, Millard Fillmore or Franklin <laughs> Pierce after those characters. And it also takes me seven years. It took me longer to write the book about World War II than it took the war to be fought. It took me <laughs> twice as long to write about Lincoln as the Civil War. So I'm not sure at this stage of my life that I can do somebody like George Washington or somebody way back there. So instead, what I've decided to do is bring my four guys together. So that's Lincoln, Teddy, Franklin, and Lyndon Johnson, and I'm writing about leadership. In a certain sense, it was underneath each one of these books, but I promised the publisher this one will only be 350 pages, so I have to get it down so it's not so fat that you can carry it around. But I really feel like I've come back to where I started. It's, it's pretty exciting because I was once upon a time a an academic, and I did analyze things and not just tell stories, and I loved political science, and I loved the idea of thinking about Plutarch and philosophy and leadership. And so I'm, part of it is going to be, the first part is, is that question of are, are traits, as I mentioned, inherited or are they developed? So I'm taking each one of my guys when they first run for office, 
when they're 23, 25, 28, and trying to look at them before they become these icons so we can see confusion and fear and they don't know who they are for sure and we can identify with them in a way that it's hard to identify once they become presidents. And then the second part is how they all go through crucibles. They all went through something that really changed them in a certain sense. I mean, Lincoln had a near suicidal depression. Teddy Roosevelt lost his wife and his mother was only 46 and his wife at 22 on the same day in the same house. And FDR, of course, had polio. And Lyndon Johnson lost, sounds like it's not similar, but he lost an election that, for him, in, when he lost the Senate election, seemed like the end of his life, and then had a nearly fatal heart attack. But they all come through it with a more sense of purpose, and their ambition becomes double. We've been talking about ambition a lot tonight. And the importance is, when you get that power, what do you do with it? And Lincoln had it from the age of 23 when he first ran, and these other guys developed it later. And then the last part is the question about the man and the times. Does the man make the times or the times make the man? And, and this is, John, hinted at before. I think we've been lucky in America that the right people sometimes seem to be in the right place at the most important times. George Washington was critical to be there at the beginning. Lincoln was obviously critical at the Civil War. FDR and Teddy Roosevelt at the turn of the 20th century to soften the industrial order. And Lyndon Johnson for civil rights and FDR for the Depression and later World War II. So it, it's fun. And it's, I promise them it'll be done by the end of this year. So if you don't see me for a while, that's what <laughs> will be happening. John, I'm going to give you the last word. I have a question for you. Is a tumultuous time like this in the news a good time to write about the past? I think so, because I do believe in the, the Churchill line I mentioned before, that the future's unknowable, but the past should give us hope. Because our story, our national story, our global story, is one of obstacles confronted and obstacles overcome. And my theory of biography is that we shouldn't look up at figures from the past adoringly or look down on them condescendingly and feel morally superior to them, but to try to look them in the eye and if we look them in the eye, take them for what they were, judge them by the forces and the voices in their time, then by humanizing them, we don't put them on pedestals. We actually, I think, are able to learn more from them. Because if they were as driven by appetite and ambition and sin and as hobbled by shortcoming as we are, and yet left the country a little better, right. then all the rest of us can too. Please thank Doris Kearns Goodwin and John Meacham. Yay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that was fun. Thank you. It was thank great. You. It was that really was, fun. That was super. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. This broadcast of the Richmond Forum is made possible by the generous support of Altria.